Code reuse is something that, in general, everyone wants to be able to do. Um, either in-house or externally, you typically want to be able to solve a problem once or license you know, a solution from somebody and just integrate it into your game and have it work. Um, it's kind of a goal that's common across many industries, not just the game industry. Um, and so there, it's, it's no surprise that there's lots of books on it, there's lots of people who speak on the topic, this sort of thing. Um, but in general, uh, what seems to typically be the case is that a lot of the things that you hear about this or think you know about this when you actually try to put them into practice, it turns out that it doesn't really work that well. And you kind of sit there scratching your head going like, you know, we thought that we were doing some of this code reuse stuff well, or we, we thought this component that we looked at to license had a good API, but when, when we actually try to use it in our game, we kind of like start to feel like getting a little more NIH about the problem because, God, it just didn't work out that well, it caused all, caused all sorts of problems and so on. Um, so where this lecture kind of comes from is uh, I worked at Rad Game Tools and I was responsible for doing Granny, which is the character animation package. Um, and at the outset of that, I kind of made the first version of it according to what I thought were standard, you know, reusable code prin principles. Uh, and it turned out to just not really work very well. You know, a lot of people had a lot of trouble integrating it. Um, it was just, it, you know, things just didn't go the way that I thought they should. So we spent a lot of time uh, when we went from 1.0 to 2.0 kind of looking at that and going, you know, what, what happened there? And we learned a lot of things, and the second incarnation of the product actually is used in, I think, 400 different SKUs, um, which is a vast, vast increase from the original one. So with this lecture, I kind of tried to go back and go, okay, what were all the things we learned about that? Um, and how did, you know, how do we make that jump? Are they generally applicable? And are, they, are there, like, things that we can kind of generalize from this that are real rules we can use to get reuse in the game industry um, that are from practice and not just some kind of theoretical thing um, that doesn't seem to really play out in practice? So before I, I get into it, I just wanted to quickly go over the types of reuse that we typically see. Um, the first kind here on the left is uh, what I call layer which is sort of like an OpenGL or Direct 3D kind of a thing, where you've got new code that you're writing on top, which is your game or something. Um, you've got reused code, uh, which is the layer, which is the, the you know, Direct 3D part um, or whatever the API is that's provided to abstract some service that's down at the bottom, which is like the 3D hardware or something like this. And this kind of reuse is, is pretty common now, and it seems to be working relatively well. Um, there's still problems with that sort of thing. The second kind is engine code, which is kind of inverted. It's like the reused code is up at the top, uh, making all the decisions, just the majority of the system, and you're just writing kind of this smaller subset of that, um, conforming to its rules, giving it information back um, to define your game. And it's pretty much responsible for, for ending up dealing with all the output and that sort of thing. And then finally, we have the third kind, which is kind of the new thing, um, which hadn't been around really in any successful way up until very recently, which is components. And those are things where it's still kind of like the layer situation, where it's, the new code is up at the top. You know, the game code is, is all in control. Um, but there's kind of these little pieces that you can license, which not only accept input from you, but actually give uh, stuff back to you that, that actually determines how the game runs. They're tightly integrated. And these are things like character animation, physics, AI, that sort of thing. Um, and they don't really talk to services directly. There's no well-defined output layer for them. They just give you stuff back, and then you're responsible for kind of doing it. Now, uh, the reason those are important and the reason that layers aren't the only thing that we need, I mean, engines I'm not really going to cover because that's just you know, a totally separate topic. Um, the reason that, that components are important is because if you look at layers, they're very limited. Um, they require there to be some well-defined kind of service at the bottom that they're abstracting, like 3D hardware. Um, and if they don't have something like that, so if you want to do something like AI where there's no agreed upon standard for what the output is, um, then they just, you know, they can't really exist. And similarly, if you have, uh, you know, two layers that you're trying to use in the game simultaneously, well, that just isn't going to work at all. You know, if I have two things that expect to be talking to the 3D hardware, that can be a huge disaster because each one wants control over it and how do you broker between them. So it's no longer this clean, like, I give something to it, it puts something out. Now, components solve both of these problems. They don't need a service at the bottom. They can just be there. They get, you know, you give them data, they process it, they give it data back, it's all good. Um, and similarly, if there's one service, you know, one output that you're, that you're dealing with that both services are and that both components are concerned with, that's fine because the input is coming back into the game where you can broker between it, resolve conflicts, do anything you need. Um, so components are really like the most powerful form of subsystem reuse that there is 
Um, and it, they're the ones that we happen to need to solve a lot of the problems of reuse that we, you know, for components we don't have currently. Um, the problem with them is they're much harder to design. And the reason for that uh, is this little back channel here that I drew. I mean, it's like a little simple arrow, but in reality, like the fact that it is coupled back to the game and you have to rely on what it's giving you to make gameplay decisions, to do all these things, uh, really does mean that it's a vastly harder design problem than just output only. Um, and not to say that, you know, Direct3 and OpenGL weren't hard to design, it's just these are even harder, and that's unfortunate. So, uh, what I'm going to do here is for a couple slides, I'm going to introduce kind of like a model for how to look at the way games integrate things which may or may not be unique to how other industries integrate things. I don't have much experience with that. But for games, there's a very specific way that integration typically happens with components. So I'm going to go through a little bit of that, and uh, then I'm going to go into some really uh, very in-depth code snippet kind of stuff where I take you through all of the different ways that kind of you can use this model to look at what's happening and making decisions about either is some licensable API that I'm going to use uh, going to work well, or I'm trying to design an API that I can reuse in-house or for other developers, you know, what can I do to make those APIs better? So here's my little uh, sort of pseudo graph. Um, the vertical axis here is how much work was done to integrate the particular uh, API into our game. And down here is time. And what some people like tend to gloss over if you read books about this sort of thing is that integration isn't really something that you just sit down and do. We don't like one day decide to integrate physics into our game, we spend a week on it, and then we're done. And that's the, the last we hear of it. That's not what happens. What really happens is, yes, that, that part of the process is over here somewhere. We do the initial integration that's in the game. But then in reality, we get usually, as we go, we use a little bit more of it, and then we get to some point where we have some major push that we're trying to do. And at that point, we typically have to start getting more involved with that API because there's things we need to do. Like, for example, we have memory budgets we need to hit. Uh, we need to add some features that we didn't think we were going to have to need or that we put off uh, integrating, and now we need them for this demo. We need them for whatever we're trying to ship. And we get kind of this little spike there. And similarly, that typically happens again at least once at the end of the project uh, when we're trying to ship. There's all of these hard constraints that we have to meet. So it really is an evolving usage. It goes from, from initial where we might even just be prototyping a game, so we're not even doing the official integration, all the way till like we're trying to ship and nail down every little last piece. Okay, so here's the kind of like abstract part. So <clears throat> try to put on your abstract cap. What I wanna do is get you in the, in the mindset of thinking about the options that you or other developers have for integrating a particular thing into their game, a particular component. Now, I took time out of this now, so we're just looking at a single point in time, and the amount of work to integrate something is here, and the amount of benefit to the game is here, and these little big blue circles are just representing options that the developer has for integration. So, you know, when I go to integrate something like character animation to my game, there's a number of ways I could do it. I look at the game engine, I look at the component, and I go, well, we could do something like this, we could wrap it like this, we could put it in over here, we could, have, we could fork it and put it, part of it over here and over here. So you've got a number of ways in which you could integrate it. And typically, as you go, you know, the more integration work it is for you, typically the more benefit you could get because the, tighter, the more tighter coupled you become to this component, the more things you can do with it. You know, if you start managing its memory for it, then you're going to get performance benefits, and there's all these kind of things that as you go up. So what happens is when you initially integrate it in, you've got some minimum bar that you're trying to meet in terms of benefit. You've got like, we need these features for the game right now, so we're just going to try and meet that. And you know, hey, you have particularly smart programmers, so they're going to kind of go, well, this is kind of the thing that's the least amount of work that gives me the most amount of benefit that meets the bar, right? But you know, I could do a little more work and maybe get something that I thought was a little more beneficial, so maybe I will. You know, so there's kind of you're going to pick something kind of down here to get it in, get it working, get the game running, and get on with things. Then as you go, at some point, there's going to be some new requirements. You're going to need more benefits from this API. And when I say benefits, I don't necessarily mean features. I just mean there are things that you need from it. The ability to like, get its memory footprint down. The ability to like, reclaim some processor time. Those things are all considered part of this because, you know, again, they're integral to shipping the game. So as this bar moves across, 
Well, you're kind of going to start going, okay, well, we need to kind of integrate a little more, and you need to integrate a little more, and you change what we're doing, call some different APIs, do that sort of thing. And you move, you move through this kind of space of possibilities that you had. And then finally, what happens if, if you, you, know, you get into trouble is you get to some part where the requirements change and there is no easy jump to get you there, right? You have this thing that you have to do and maybe it's like um, some kind of hard, hard budget that you have to meet and you realize that the way that you were using the API, there just is no simple fix. There's no way that you can get, say, streaming, which you want to implement in your game, into this component in any reasonable amount of work. It's going to be this massive thing where you have to do all sorts of stuff behind its back and do all these kind of things. So you end up looking at a situation like this where you're like, wow, to get this extra thing that we needed to do to ship this game, we have to do a massive amount of work to deal with this component. So to kind of summarize that, it's like, hey, if the API has these little steps, and I want to meet this minimum bar of features that I've got to get for this next drop, I want to go from unsolved to solved, I just want to take a little step. I want to do some work to get it, whatever I feel is the minimum amount of work that I should generally have to do to get this thing in there. But if there is no options for that, then they typically will have to jump all the way to something which, while you had to do a ton of work to get there, it really you know, solved a lot more problems than you were looking to solve. You ended up doing a lot more management or a lot more work with this component than you would have liked, and maybe there are fringe benefits to that, but a lot of times those benefits aren't really realized to you. You just wanted to manage one little piece of it for, for the component, for example, but now you ended up having to manage all of its memory, let's say. So I call that an integration discontinuity, which is like, I'm kind of going along using this component, and all of a sudden I hit this wall, and I'm like, man, this is a disaster. And unfortunately, they typically happen around ship time, just when it's like most unfortunate to have such a thing happen. So <clears throat> I guess uh, this, is, this is kind of a little like uh, beating a dead horse, but just to go through it. If you think about this yellow line, as how much work you actually did to integrate the product, meaning I'm actually doing this work and I keep doing work and I do more work and I do more work. When you have these discontinuities in there, what happens is you're really doing more work than the benefit that you were getting, right? So when I have to do more work than the minimum that I wanted to do to get this feature in, then the actual benefit to your app isn't going up commensurate with the work. You're like spending a lot of extra work to work around this API that you're forced to deal with. And this doesn't even have to be increasing, because what could happen is, if you're spending time integrating the component, you may find out that the way that you are integrating it isn't actually working. And you have to like rip some of it out, redo the way you were doing it, throw out code you wrote to reintegrate it a different way. So you can actually end up going like, OK, we got to tear some out. We tried this other method, and that didn't work. So then we tried going around it this other way, and we finally found an end run that worked, and now we keep going, and so on. So I guess all I'm trying to say with this graph is like it's, it's non-trivial. When you, when you have these like API uh, problems in there, it really can force you to blow out a lot of work. And um, that's why I posit that's like the real problem. The goal that we're trying to solve when we dissolve reusable APIs is to think about this and to try to make it so that at all times as people integrate the product, they're always able to do only what they think they should have to do to get the next thing that they need out of the API and not waste all of this time. Because really, when they use code, I mean, from a licensable perspective, that's what the customer ends up remembering, right? They don't remember if you saved them some work at some point. They remember when you caused them this huge disaster right around ship time, right? And similarly, if you're the person doing that, you don't want that disaster. So this is really the thing that I think is most important. Now, unfortunately, uh, the current trends in API design a lot, you know, with things where you're kind of wrapping stuff up, doing a lot of encapsulation, doing a lot of insulation, what they actually do is they take the number of options that are available to the developer, which are these, you know, blue things like I said before, and they start to reduce them. They go, you know what, you can't really have access to these things. You can't call these things without calling these other things. And at some point, sometimes you even get to the point where you look at an API and you're like, you know what, there's only one thing I can do with this. Like, they've totally walled me off. I have no options anymore. This is a disaster. And these kind of components typically fail. Um, but a lot of times we're stuck with just this kind of thing where like, kind of there's a low level or a high level way to use it and so on. Um, and I argue that really, like, you know, we want things to look like this and ideally fill in this gap that I was talking about before. Okay. So uh, that's kind of the end of the abstract part. So. Now, you get, now you're going to have to uh, read some code snippets on here. So hopefully, can everyone like read this well enough to see, say, that? Yes. Say me? OK, good. So these are the characteristics that I have identified that I think are 
are uh, sort of indicative of how that those those blue points because that was very abstract. You know, I drew a graph, had some blue points on it. You know, well, that's all great, but how do I actually know when I'm looking at an API? You know, do, is it going to have these problems? Are there discontinuities in there? Um, you know, how much options does it really give me? And uh, originally, I only had four. In fact, if you look in the uh, in the in my lecture notes, there were only four. But uh, I was showing some of the slides to Chris Hecker, and he was like. You don't talk about flow control enough. You've got to talk about flow control. It's, it's implicit in all the things you're talking about, but you're not talking about it. So I looked at it, and he was totally right. So I added a fifth one, which kind of like does really, uh, it, it does really matter. So props to Chris for that. The five things are, in order, uh, granularity, which is to say that you know, I have some API, and I can split it into smaller APIs. So if I have an API A, I can replace it with two APIs that do the things that it did, but give me a little more control. Um, there's redundancy, which is to say that there's an API that does something, which is A, but I could alternatively call some other API which does the same thing, B, only maybe it takes slightly different parameters or it does it in a slightly different way. So I have you know, some options there. Um, there's coupling, which is when you have one thing and if you do that thing in the API, you're required to do some other thing. So there's like this hidden kind of link in between them that you are not really able to overcome. Um, there's retention, which is when the API kind of has two things, and like one's on your side, and then the other's on their side, and you have to kind of mirror them, like making a scene graph or something like this. And then finally, there's flow control, which is like, who's calling who? Am I calling them? Is the component calling me? Am I calling it and it's calling me back? You know, what's going on here? Now, the important thing to remember is these are just characteristics, and each one of them has trade offs, which I'll talk about later. So it's not, some of them are always bad, but the majority of them have like, sometimes it's good to have, have like less granularity, sometimes it's good to have more. So, you know, don't think of them as like hard coded. We want all these five things. It's like, no, they're, each one of them is just a characteristic, and we'll talk about how to interpret them in a second. So, uh, to go through the kinds of granularity, because some of them are non obvious. The most obvious thing is, hey, if I have something like update orientation, and what this function is supposed to do is the API has some measure of my orientation that it's keeping, and it's got some measure of the change in orientation, and I want to go ahead and apply that change, so now when I use the orientation, it's the new orientation. Well, you know, simple granularity change is, okay, I want to break that down into steps. I want to get the orientation myself, I want to get the change in orientation myself from the API, and then I want to you know, set the thing with that change. And these are angles or something, so that's not like any kind of overloaded plus operator. It's just like, you know, hey, it's like you know, just a, a, a regular 2D angle. Um, that's the most simplest kind of granularity. The reason that I want that is because, hey, I may want to modify whatever is going to happen in there, right? I may not want it to just use it directly, um, the change that it has. I may want to play with it, right? And similarly, the kind of less obvious version of that is, I may not ever want to change it. I may want this to happen exactly the same way that it would have if I just called it, but I have this other thing that I want to have happen. So instead of like modifying things by inserting myself in the middle, really all I'm doing is I'm separating when the API is going to do those two things. And that may not be that important in other industries, but in the game industry, that's like crucial because sometimes you thread things, sometimes you have like kind of things that you need to hold over till the end of the frame. So you really don't want to be in positions where <clears throat> you don't have that kind of control. So that kind of granularity is also important. So, okay, uh, so now let's talk about redundancy. Because um, granularity, hopefully that's pretty clear. So redundancy is just, you know, in its most basic form is something like this. I wanted to pass a three by three matrix before, and now I want to pass a quaternion. So the API gives me two calls, and I can enter in either way, and it just accepts the, you know, the type of parameter that I was looking for. Doesn't do anything different. C and D are a different uh, way of looking at that, which is that, hey, sometimes I figure that there should be like these basic things that it can just do for me. I don't want to have to make my own identity matrix and pass or that sort of stuff. There's just constants that the API builds in that's easy for me to use, and that way you know, I just know it's taken care of. And similarly, oftentimes there are things that I would do with the orientation, and I just want it to do those basic operations for me to set the operation, I mean, to set the orientation, rather, and that's D. So those are just some different redundant ways of doing that. Now, the sort of non, the, the sort of subtle way of, of, uh, of having redundancy is this kind here, where if you remember in the previous slide, I couldn't fit on this slide, we had this kind of operation where we're getting the orientation, changing the orientation, getting the change in the orientation, and then setting it. Well, if I was to go up a level of granularity from that, I could have the option of bundling those three calls in two different ways. I could bundle the first two calls and leave the third one at the low level, I mean, the, the, the um, finer level of granularity. 
Or I could bundle the second two calls and leave this one at the finer level. So they're both like kind of equivalent. They're at the same level of granularity, these two snippets, but they have different choices in redundancy in terms of, they, they have different choices in what to bundle, which makes kind of a redundant API there. So that can typically be pretty useful as you make coarser grained versions of an API to have the user have the ability to choose which ones they're um, going to bundle and which ones they're not. So now we get to coupling, which is not really a trade-off thing. Coupling is pretty much always bad. Um, but you know it's usually also unavoidable in a lot of places. So the simplest kind of coupling in an API is when you have something that does like a bunch of th things to lots of objects, and you have no control over that. So you know a, a tip, very typical thing is like simulate in a physics simulator, where it's just like, hey, you know, I, maybe I wanted some control over what was getting simulated because I have some special things that I want here. But like maybe this API doesn't let me do that, so I have to just like have everything happen at once. Um, okay, so that obviously that's bad coupling. That's it, you know inter-object coupling. The other kind of coupling is, hey, I've got some APIs which kind of depend on this one state that I set. So maybe I call set time and it re you know, retains this time information, but then like lots of different APIs use that. So I'm kind of creating a hidden sort of coupling between those APIs in the sense that like, you know, now they all have to kind of have this right ordering of if I set the time and then call this, I can't then call the other thing which counted on the time being the thing from the previous frame. So I'm like kind of having this kind of like a, a hidden coupling that I have to think about in my head. Um, the c snippet C is the kind of coupling where you have in like a GL begin, GL end, for example, which is that there isn't any identification for a particular lock that I'm doing, so I can only have one of them at any given time. You know, I don't specify, I don't really get anything back from this, and I don't pass anything into this, so there's really just this one implicit lock that either I am or I'm not using, um, and that kind of couples it in the sense that two pieces of code can't do that, so you have to make sure that all of the code always just is serially doing something like this. D is very simple, which is, hey, if there are internal buffers, are those internal buffers going to be like things that we have to pay attention to? So in this case, if I was returning a care star, for example, this is probably returning the same buffer as this. So I've got this kind of hidden coupling of like string one actually becomes the same thing as string two here because, you know, whatever. Ho hopefully that doesn't happen too much in modern APIs, but, you know, figured I'd mention it. Snippet E is kind of a more insidious form of coupling. It's when the allocation of something is coupled to its initialization. And a lot of APIs have this problem, unfortunately. Um, a lot of times, developers don't really want to have to be able to say, oh, you know what? Get me the memory for this thing and initialize it. They might want to go like, uh, I'm going to provide the memory, and then could you just initialize it in place? Or, you know what? You're managing the memory, but I need to initialize this guy because I'm like reading it from this special stream that I have packed or whatever. So that's a kind of coupling where like, I bundle two things together that cannot ever be separated. Um, F is where I have coupling between some special type in the system. Like, if I only accept a matrix for my orientation, this is kind of gets back to the redundancy thing, if that's the only type that I accept here, then even if I have some like representation of the matrix myself, I have to constantly like make it with the other, you know, with the API. I have to say like, hey, make one of your special fancy matrix objects so that I can actually call your functions. And the final kind of coupling is when you depend on, uh, when, when the API doesn't let you get away from depending on their file format. So in this case, it's like, if the only way to get an object is to read that object with their file reading routine, right? I can't construct it myself with my own reading it in, then I'm kind of dependent on their file I.O. routines and their data format, and there's nothing I can do about that, really. Okay. Retention is pretty simple, so not many code snippets here. Uh, the idea there is just, hey, if I have stuff that is you know, data that I kind of own or that I am the one who's like in charge of, but the API forces me to announce that data to it and it keeps a copy, that's retention. So in A, it's the simplest kind. I have, you know, I'm gonna set the time or I'm gonna set what I think the value of pi should be for the application. Um, then it just retains that information, it's gonna use it everywhere. Um, in B, we have kind of like, yeah, well, you know what? I'm gonna tell you that this object is parented to this other object, so every time you do something, like update the orientation, you're gonna take that into consideration. And then finally in D, um, we have the kind where you're retaining services from the application. So the API is kind of going, you know what? When I open a file, I could call you back with some of these things. So it's gonna retain the services that you provided and use them whenever it would have used them in the middle of processing some of its various function calls. And finally, we have flow control. And flow control is uh, pretty easy to imagine. Pretend these are just stack traces. And flow control is just, you know, a measure of flow control anyways. It's like, who is calling who? 
Um, is it the case that I, you know, the game is on the bottom of the stack, then it calls into the library, and that's always the way it looks? That's all we get. So library on top, game on bottom. Or do we have a situation where, hey, the game, which you know, was originally calling the library, now gets called back, and there is sort of library in between game on either side of the stack? Then we could get you know, totally crazy and say, well, a lot of times then the game has to call the library something for, so we can keep ad infinitum if we allow this kind of flow control stuff to happen. We can get these ridiculous stacks where it's like, I call the library, library calls me back, I call the library, maybe it calls me back one more time. Now, this is obviously you know, kind of a, a negative thing because the more this happens, the more kind of complex it is to visualize in your head what's going on, your relationship to this library. And furthermore, uh, it can be really kind of nasty where it has to call back one of your classes or you have to have void stars which tell it what the, you know, the data is that you're going to need inside there because you no longer have your scope. So you know, there's a lot of complexity when you start introducing complicated kinds of flow control that aren't just A. Um, and, the files, and the code snippets for that are, this is the most basic kind. Like we said before, I just call a function and it returns something. Everyone's happy. B is the slightly more complicated version where it's going to call me back so you know, I do open file and I get a call back for it. C is just up here because it's the same as B. If anyone thinks that C is not the same as B, um, definitely rethink that because hey, this is just a function pointer, right? A virtual function is just there's a V table somewhere. So if you're inheriting from one of the API's classes, that's exactly the same thing as setting some file callbacks. And then finally, we have, you know, hey, you could use exceptions or something like this transfer flow control, but hopefully that's not like a big part of any licensable API. So here's the recap. We have granularity. And essentially what we do with that is we trade off flexibility for simplicity. The more coarser grain the granularity is, the simpler the API is to use because there's less calls, less things for the user to get wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But we give up flexibility. As we go up there, we're kind of at the point where they're really kind of out of control. You know, they don't have the control. They're kind of just telling you what to do, and the API does it you know, entirely the way that they want. With redundancy, it's really a trade-off of convenience versus orthogonality. Um, if, redundant, if your thing is very redundant, then you're going to be very convenient because there's tons of these APIs to choose from for every different thing to do. Uh, but you're not very orthogonal, right? There's, it's kind of a little harder for the user to keep in their head because there isn't just one way of doing the things that they're going to do. There's lots of different ways. With coupling, um, there really isn't much of a trade-off. It's like the API, we'd like it to be as decoupled as possible because all it's doing is putting restrictions on what the programmer can and can't do. So there's really no benefit to that one. Retention is kind of a synchronization versus automation thing where it's like, if I retain a lot of data, then it's kind of hard because the, uh, the user has to synchronize all that stuff, and that's bad. Um, so you know, immediate mode things are better because there's no, there isn't that synchronization involved where they have to constantly keep you updated. Um, but you know you may lose some automation there because if you have all this retained data, then the app, uh, the, the API can maybe um, automate things for you that it couldn't otherwise. And finally, flow control uh, again, not much of a trade-off there. Uh, if you can get away with just always having the game in control and it calls the, the app and it returns to you, well, that's always simpler because you don't want to have to worry about these like kind of deep callback situations um, or how you get data down through the through the library to you on the other side and so on. And uh, the final thing that I want to mention about that is just that looking at all of those trade-offs, they're not necessarily constant throughout the course of the integration. When I first integrate a component into my game, I'm probably looking for very low granularity, so I'm looking for <clears throat> a very coarse-grained uh, granularity approach and uh, a lot of retention. Because I just want to do something like say, hey, load some characters off disk and animate them walking around and like, free them later. Like, that's kind of the level I'm looking for when I'm just like pre-production or you know, doing my first integration into the game, whatever. But as I get to the end of the project, I typically need the reverse, right? I need a lot of control, so I want fine, grain, you know, fine granularity in several places that I really need to, to manhandle. And I don't want a lot of retention because I've built all these data structures that say the way my game works, and the less of that I have to mirror on your side, um, on the API side, the better. So uh, is everyone clear on that? Is there any questions? Hopefully that, OK. Um, so what I'm going to go through now is I'm going to go through some looking at actual code snippets that uh, you know they're they're not exactly the same as as uh, code snippets in a game, but they're very very similar to it. So we can look at what happens uh, when some of these things are not at the proper level that they should be, just to give you a feel for if you're designing API how you should be looking at it, or if you're evaluating an API, looking at what the consequences of that API are. So uh, obviously I've I've changed this. So this isn't none of these are are specifically somebody's API. 
Uh, they're just like very representative of the standard ones that are out there. So first thing, let's look at game provided services. So in this case, um, I kind of alluded to this in earlier slides. Here's a case where I want the, um, <clears throat> the API. Uh, I was just kind of calling this read file thing in the API, and I was getting back whatever the, the, the thing is that it gives me back, some kind of object that I'm going to use. Um, I want to stop it from, from touching the disk. You know, I'm, I'm going to manage that, because I'm reading from my own database format or something like that. Um, so typically what most APIs do, I'm assuming they provide this at all, which hopefully they do, um, is we get something like snippet B, which is that I set some file callbacks, which is basically just me saying I'm providing like f open, f read, and so on now. Um, so just call me when you would have called those. And the problem with that, not only is it a problem for flow control, because hey, now I'm you know, getting called back by the, uh, by the API, but it's also a problem for coupling in kind of a non-obvious way. And the reason that there's coupling here is because you've bundled the concept of reading the file with interpreting it into this object that you can use. So I've actually kind of smacked two separate things together, one of which is loading an, interp lo loading an actual like, chunk of data off the disk, and the other is interpreting it. So even if I allow the, the user to do those operations, I haven't given them any control over when they happen, because they're still going to happen right at this call, and there's no way to separate those two things out. So, um, and you know, if the user wanted to actually separate them out, what they have to do is make heinously complicated versions of these that do like caching behind somebody's back, or you know, God knows what's going to happen. Uh, so the much more decoupled way, in which most, like very, very few APIs do, but some do, is uh, to kind of give you the ability to just pass in some file data. It's like, okay, I already read it. Why don't you go ahead and interpret this in, into a thing for me, right? And that's kind of more what you want to see, because if you want this kind of control, typically you want something that's a lot more like this, where I'm just feeding it chunks, and it's interpreting them into the type that I want. Now, is that the most decoupled we can get? You know, it's not. Um, you look at that, and you go, well, this is still something that's kind of owned by them. Right, the thing that's coming back, like came back from the API, and I had no control. Like that's got to have some memory somewhere. Like something's going on here. Um, at the very least, let's pretend that that file data that it's interpreting is compressed in some way. Uh, so at the very least, it's got to decompress it first before it can be used. So what's happening inside this call is we, you know, the API is allocating a buffer, decompressing into it, and then returning me a pointer to some part of that. Um, well, I could decouple it further, right? I can go like this which is to say that I want it to decompress this raw file data for me into file data, and then it can, do, it can you know, make the thing for me that I can use, and then I can get rid of this file data because I don't need it anymore. Um, but the problem with that is, hey, you know what? It's still allocating memory. So then I typically get right back to where I was before, where I have to then give it more, yet more callbacks. Um, I, you know, I was trying to eliminate those before, but now I'm right back to it, so I've got to let it allocate the memory for me. So finally, we get to F, which is more of the like, properly decoupled version, which is to say that here, now I've got you know, a four-line version of what was a one-line thing before, but now I have complete control, right? I get the size that I will need for this thing. I malloc that, or you know, new it, or however you want to get it. Call your own special allocator, do whatever you want. Um, then I decompress it, and then I ask it to make the thing. So now everything is entirely within my purview here, and all it's doing is translating uh, you know, a pointer to something else. Now, we can still get decoupled one further step. This one is, is not necessarily necessary all the time, but for certain types of APIs, it's crucial. And that is, this is the snippet that we had. But what we really might want to do is something more like this, where we're saying, you know what? I don't really even want you to require me to call one of your functions before I can use some of this data. I don't want your, you know, however your pack data format works to influence that. Um, so what I, what I want to do here is I want to just say, hey, you know what? Give me, you know, make one of these things, and I'm going to read it in however the hell I want to read it in, you know? Um, and that's kind of important because maybe I then want to go ahead and control exactly where that thing is placed with my own allocators and read it directly in. And when, by the time we get to H, we realize, you know what? We didn't need the API at all for this process, right? Simple two-line thing. If the data is transparent to us, we can just do this and have complete control just like it was something in our game. And we haven't really affected the way the API functions at all, right? All the rest of the API can still work exactly the same way, but now we've kind of removed it entirely from this process. 
So again, I'm not trying to suggest that the difference between A and H is like always use H or anything like this. I'm just saying like here is an example of the huge spread of ways in which we could do this one thing. And typically, you do end up wanting to do this one quite a bit in an average game for you know, APIs that are tightly integrated. So A is good, and a lot of times the user will call that. But H is also good, and you don't want to be in a situation where the only thing you have is A. So let's look at another common thing, which is parameter redundancy. Parameter redundancy, like I said before, is um, <clears throat> the ability to kind of like call something with two, in two different flavors or multiple flavors and so on. In A, I have the, uh, the original version of the API's function, which inverts some transform. And let's pretend that the transform we're passing and the inverse we get back are both in their, like that's their data type. That's their object or whatever it is. Um, well, the problem is when we start realizing that, hey, we have our own transform type and we got to kind of pass that in, um, we end up with, with something like B, where like maybe I have like a floating point uh, vector of position and a floating point vector that's the rotation, and now I've got to call the API to bundle it up into one of their things, and then when I'm done with their function, I've got to call copy transform to kind of you know, get it out again to, into my format. And that can get really heinous if my version, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the object type that I'm using for a transform, also has this process that has to happen, then I've got to get it out of mine, put it into theirs, call their function, get it out of theirs, then put it back into mine. And like that seems kind of silly, because like all we were doing is this, and now we have to do all this. So like, you know, it seems like kind of a contrived example. But at the same time, like I see this all the time in actual code. Like this sort of thing happens all the time. It's not like this kind of random thing. So it's like you're always currying back between, back and forth between these types, and it ends up just being this kind of mess. So really what you want to do is get as close as possible to D, um, which is where maybe the API has several versions of this function because it knows that everyone has their own format for position and ori orientation. So let's try to provide as many of them as we can to reduce the chances that they have to do this kind of ridiculous dance. Um, so here we're kind of like saying, well, you know, if you've got a quaternion, well, you know, pass that directly into us and we'll just kind of like take these two, modify them, and pass them back out to you. Okay. Um, so let's look at the transition between a coarse-grained uh, a coarse grained operation and a fine-grained one. In code snippet A, um, I've got kind of a retain mode thing going on here where the app has some, some kind of object called a node which has some stuff in it. And I'm asking it to update it, and then I'm asking it to render it. Two operations on the node. Um, I'm highlighted this one because maybe all I really want to do is change the way that operation works. The rendering is great, all the rendering is happy, but the updating is not doing it things the way I want. So in code snippet B, I've expanded it out. And since I'm not using the node structure anymore, as a developer, I now have to duplicate all of the stuff that that thing did. And I'm just kind of making up some stuff that it did here. Um, the update part did those three things, and the render part did those five things. As you can see, as a developer, I'm a little sad because I didn't really want to know all that render stuff. I didn't want to do any of that, but I had to do it all because I wanted to stop using that node thing so I could get control over the update part. Well, that's not very preferable. And if we look at that, uh, what we really wanted to do is just kind of have the exact same call that was there before, but now instead of using the bundled node type, I just pass the parts of that node type that I wanted. Um, and this is a very easy thing for an API to do, but unfortunately, almost none of them actually seem to do it. A lot of times when they have these kind of bundled constructs, they don't actually provide the exact same function in an unbundled way, which is really kind of unfortunate. Um, and similarly, I could look at a further kind of granularity option, which is if they did want a little bit of control over one of the processes, maybe I even offer another level of granularity in between those two, where it's like, not only do I allow you to kind of go from node to non-node so I can break up these two things and not have to worry about this one, but maybe I also allow you to do part of the render in me now and pass in this additional part so that I can sort of take a little bit of the process away from you, but you still do the rest of it and I don't have to worry about it. Okay, and now here's the final example we're going to look at. Um, which is kind of the retain mode problem, the typical retained mode API problem that we get into um, when you don't provide some of the ability to do things immediately. So I've used the physics engine here because this is the, the they're kind of the thing that's most typically known for being very retained mode heavy. Uh, snippet A is kind of what you would typically see in a physics API. It's like I'm going to create this rocket and this pole that's stuck in the ground, and I'm going to create a joint between them. Anyone who's ever played Rocket Jockey knows where this comes from. Um, and I'm going to kind of like constrain the rocket to the pole so that as the rocket goes, it kind of is circling around the pole. 
And then I call simulate, and it kind of just all magically works, and everyone's happy. My rocket's flying around is great. But what happens, unfortunately, in game development is, is you know, that, that's not really very representative of what happens. What typically happens is I've got something that's like some sample thing that's very fine-grained, like is the user pressing the X button? And what I have to do if this is what my API looks like is I've got to go, oh, well, if they're pushing the X button, then if I'm not already having one of these hook lines in there, I've got to make one. And if I had one and they weren't pushing the button, then I've got to delete it and remember that I deleted it. And then I can simulate. So what I'm essentially doing there is I'm writing almost the like diff for every part of my game where I diff their retain mode version uh, with what I actually know to be going on in my game, and hopefully I did the diff properly and made all the right calls to like change it up, right? Um, that is really heinous when you end up working in an app like this. Like, I think probably most people in the audience have had to deal with this at some point if they've ever used a heavily retained mode API. Um, what I'd much rather do is turn this ugly snippet that I don't like into this snippet. I mean, this is all I was trying to do. All I'm trying to do is say, hey, you know what? Do a joint between the rocket and the pole when the X button's down. Like, that's what I was trying to do. So instead of writing this, I want to be able to write this. And that's the real difference between immediate mode and retained mode. It's like, Immediate mode allows you to procedurally do something. So you've got code. Code is very powerful. You're making decisions in that code, and you want to be able to just dish the output of that code directly to the API and have it use it. You don't want to have to go through a data intermediary, which is the retained part of it, which you constantly have to worry about how to differentially update. And the thing that I'd like to remind everyone here, because, hey, you know, the, I can only show so much on a slide, um, is that... Having a do joint call like this immediate mode is much more powerful than if I, say, had just a Boolean that I could turn on and off in a retained mode joint. And the reason for that is, what if I have no idea what pole the guy is going to catch this time? Well, like, I don't want to have to do stuff like create speculative joints between all the rockets and all the poles and then just turn the Boolean on and off so I can have the nice immediate mode feel, right? I don't want to do any of that stuff. So the idea behind immediate mode is, I've gone through the code, I've figured out exactly what I want to do, I just want to call the API with it right there, and I don't want to have to worry about having set up a retained mode structure previously, which will allow me to have that code look the way I want, which is what Booleans in a, in a retained mode thing would do for you. So that's not a substitute. Um, so finally, you know, at, now I've hopefully given you an idea of how those five characteristics kind of work when you look at the code. Um, what ends up happening, I think, with most APIs, not that there's that many that have tried kind of to do all this stuff, but when you, when you look at them, I've talked to some people who have actually done a bunch of this stuff, and, and they kind of seem to concur with me. So when you kind of follow these, either by intuition or because you've sat down and actually looked at what all they, they all are, um, the APIs that work the best for reuse across multiple projects that are different, very different from each other, um, you know, wide reuse kinds of situations um, that people have a pleasant time with, is that when you optimize these five characteristics, you get an API which kind of has gradual tiers to it, right? There's like lots of different kind of ways that I can access this API, and I can gradually move between them as I need to. They're highly decoupled, so I may even have multiple tiers of stuff that don't even necessarily have to like kind of couple to each other. They're very separated. If I decide to start getting more, you know, uh, finer grained in one area, then I don't have to drag down everything there. They're all kind of like staying at the level that I roughly want. Um, they have no retain mode stuff at their bottom. So in other words, at the very, very finest level that I can call this API, it is not retaining data, at least not that I know about. If it is, it's behind the scenes. It's caching. It's stuff they're doing for performance. But I am not responsible for doing that caching for them. And as you kind of go up through the tiers, maybe there is some retain mode. You know, sometimes I do want to just say create rigid body, create rigid body, create joint. There's nothing wrong with that. But by the time I get down to the part where I'm, I'm asking the API I want control here, I don't expect to have that be happening. Um, and then finally, uh, I'd, I'd say that you, you pretty much never want to be in the situation of having the API dictate the flow control to you, because most of the time there's, there's really just no, no reason for that. So that's kind of what I see is like the way APIs look when you've really kind of got this stuff dialed. Um, and granted, like, you know, like I was saying with Granny 1 and Granny 2, I think we got a lot of the stuff in Granny 2, but, you know, I look back at it now, obviously, and there's tons of stuff I would do differently. So it's not like I'm claiming that, you know, I've ever made an API which does all these things perfectly, but it definitely, as, as you kind of feel like you're making APIs better, I feel like they go towards this. And I think over the next few years, we'll start seeing APIs that kind of, if they can do this, will kind of get more towards that kind of perfect point where all these things are working together properly. So, um, you know, some of you may, may not have wanted to spend a full uh, 50 minutes 
talking about this stuff. So, you know, right now I've summarized it all into just like a minute's worth, so you can get it all right now. If you are designing an API, or if you're about to evaluate an API, these couple slides should give you everything that you need to know to cheat on the exam. Um, the first and second things that you need to know, and this is kind of obvious, but I just wanted to state it because most of this lecture is about the more detailed stuff, is just that always write the usage code first. You know, I mean, when you sit down to design an API, always write all of the like examples of using it that you can think of. Write those first. Don't start by like opening up an H file and start writing a class declaration or something like that. Start by writing use user code. <laughs> and furthermore, if you've got a game sitting around, which a lot of you do, like pretend you're integrating it. Like pretend you have the magical API that does everything you want. Go into that game and integrate it through and look at what you came up with. That's the first pass API. That's the best first pass API you're going to get. Because all of your intuition is enabled there naturally, and you've got all of the constraints of that game already playing into it. So you've got a really good first example there. And furthermore, if you're evaluating one, you may think that the best thing to do is go read the documentation of the, of the tools that you're you know, potentially evaluating. Placing. Don't do that yet. Pretend you have the perfect one you want. Pretend to integrate it into the game you've got for a day or two. Look at what you came up with. And now when you evaluate those components from the different vendors, go, how close does this match what I'm going to do? Like, don't think in their terms first. Think in your terms first. And then as you evaluate your APIs, go like, which one of these things you know, links up with me? So anyway, most of the lecture was not on that. But I figured it was very important to mention because a lot of people won't do that. So now we get to the stuff that hopefully this lecture has argued is, is the right thing to do. The first thing is that any kind of retain mode construct that this API puts forth, I should be able to do the exact same thing in immediate mode um, by just calling a function with the things that the retain mode structure had in it. right? And that was the thing about the update node, render node thing. I should always be able to kind of have the non-node version of those so I can just call them immediately. And what that does is that allows you to transition from the retained mode to a more finer controlled immediate mode when you need to. If you don't have those, then when you need to transition, you're going to have to go, oh my god, like what was that node thing doing? I don't even know. i got to go learn about that, whatever. <clears throat> Second thing, anytime there's callbacks or inheritance, there should be an equivalent way to just make an API call that doesn't have to use either of those things. If you ever see something that requires inheritance or requires you to use callbacks, then that is giving up both flow control and it is coupling you. So you should never see that. If you see something like that, that's a red flag. Um, third thing, no API should ever require you to use a specific data type of its own if you know full well that your game and probably every other game in the universe has their own version of that data type. Like the last thing you need is for you to go license three components from three different vendors. They all use different vector types, and you've got to use all three different vector types in various places of your app because that's what they expect. Like that's the last thing you want to have happen. Uh, number four, any API function that you would not consider atomic for purposes of writing your game. If you think there's any way that you might not consider that thing atomic at any time during integration, then it should be able to be replaced by between, like, say, two and four different APIs that replace it that are more granular, right? And that doesn't count maybe access or functions, but just, you know, the actual physical operational calls. Um, because if you look at something and you go, you know what? That thing looks kind of a little high level to me, and I don't see any way to break it down further, then that's a really good example of where, you know, some point deep in the ship process, you're going to have to hope you can get one of their API developers on the phone to kind of put in some backdoor access for you or something like that, and that's really bad. Um, and the final four things. Uh, any data which doesn't have a reason for being opaque should be transparent. Um, if you just have data structs that the API is using for things, those things should not be opaque. Right? You always have the choice as a developer of not touching the data structures of the API. So if you're concerned about making, you know, you know, touching a kind of internal structure or something like that, and having that break when the API gets revved, you can always decide not to do it, right? There's nothing forcing you to go look at you know, some of the structures that the, that the API defines. But when it comes down to ship time, you may find that you want that access to do some things in certain places in your app. And if they aren't exposed to you, then you've kind of got this problem where you'd better hope the API has actual calls that do the sorts of stuff you need directly, or you're going to be in big trouble. 
So the idea is you should look through it, and while you shouldn't expect to use all of those things, you should tr try to make sure that they're there for when you do need them. You should never have to use their resource management, which means like memory management, file management, string management, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you should uh, never have to use their file format, and you should always be able to get full source code to the runtime. So those are pretty simple. Thanks, Casey.